Um, just to give an introduction, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, one of the one of the characters, and that is specifically David. I think when we think about um, David, especially David as a Balchuva or David in sitting, what kind of famous story comes to mind at first? Right, David, David and Bathsheba, right? It's the main, it's the main kind of story uh, that comes up when we think about. Um, oh, sorry, I think I gave you my notes instead. Yeah, I was looking for those. Like, yeah. <laughs> 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 sorry, she said all the matter. I'm like, where did I go? Um, okay. Anyway, so when we think of David and David and Bathsheba, right? That's a story that comes to mind as like the major sin that David, David has has done in his life. So what I want to do is actually not talk about that. But I want to talk about a story. Uh, well. Um, a story that comes um, much earlier, and that is the story of David, Naval, and Abigail, uh, which is earlier in Shmuel Pet, um, or actually, sorry, in Shmuel Alan, but what we're going to see is that in this story of David, Naval, and Abigail, there are a lot of precursors to the sin of David and Bathsheba. Um, and as we, as we read through it, we're going to see kind of a lot of what ends up happening with David and Bathsheba and with Uriah um, later on. Um, actually, in this story, there are a lot of hints to it, and it almost also goes that way, but the last minute, things are kind of held back. And we'll see kind of how Abigail plays a very large role in that. Um, so I think it's interesting just to look at this story as a precursor and see kind of that, you know, giant kind of sins or controversy don't occur in a vacuum. There's usually some kind of warning sign, there's usually some kind of buildup. And what we'll see here, I think, is that with the story of David and Bathsheba, that doesn't happen out of nowhere. A lot of that has really been building up since the story of David, Naval, and Abigail. So that's what we're going to look at today and try to kind of, as we do a reading of that story, a close reading of that story, to keep in our minds that we're looking for hints of the story of David, David and Bathsheba. Um, the other thing which I think is important to kind of recognize here also is that a lot of, to think a little bit about character development and think about David's character. And I think what's, why I love kind of talking about David and learning about David is I think that a lot of the characteristics or the character traits that make David who he is, who make David uh, the powerful and successful uh, leader are also character traits that, um, that when left unchecked can lead him down a, a dark path. Whether it's his power, his charisma, his um, wanting to defend everyone. So all these kind of traits, they are traits that are inherently negative. We don't want a leader who's passive, who doesn't know how to lead, who doesn't want to defend his people, who lacks charisma. These are all character traits that make him a great leader, but these are character traits that, again, can take him down a very dark path. And I think that really uh, what we're going to have a chance to, uh, well, uh, what we're going to have a chance to analyze and, and look at today is to really think about character traits that, and we think about our own personal growth as well. What are the character traits that make us who we are? Um, and sometimes character development isn't saying that I'm going to cancel out this character trait because it can lead me down a dark, dark path, but it's recognizing um, that sometimes our character traits, whether it's ambition, whether it's charisma, or different things like that, can lead us down a dark path. But they're still very much a part of who we are and what makes us unique, what makes us ourselves. And how can we kind of be aware of kind of triggers that are going to happen and make sure we can kind of keep ourselves um, on, a, on a path where, where our character trait is really being used for good. So again, that's what we're going to see here with the story of David, um, Uriah, and sorry, David, Naval, and Abigail. Um, that again, looking for these character traits of David, why does it lead him, why is it stopped here? Why is he able to control himself and stop himself from sitting in this character? but he ends up sitting later on with Bacha. Um, just a couple of disclaimers before we start looking at the parrot. First of all, many of these ideas that we're going to learn about today are not my own. Um, many of them are there went many wonderful biblical scholars who talk a lot about Sefer Shmuel. I gave you guys at the end kind of a further reading list, if you're curious, of um, Amnon Bazak, or Rabbi Heinz Angel, or Shmuel Kurtzfeld, um, Moshe Garcia, who also wrote, wrote a, a book on Sefer Shmuel. So these are all uh, really great scholars on, um, on Sefer Shmuel, so I encourage you to read them. Many of the ideas today are, are not um, original. Here you go. Pass it back original ideas of my own, but really take, to take off of a lot of their um, um, thoughts and developed ideas on Saber Shmuel. Okay, so that's disclaimer number one. Um, disclaimer number two is really, that's what a disclaimer was to give us just a sense of where we are in this parak and what exactly is about to happen. So before we even look at the parak, if you look on the third page, or sorry, on the fourth page, where you see chart number two, where it says a lot of charts going on, I know, but where it says chart number two, just to give us a little bit of context, what's happening in this parak. 
So this parrot that we're going to read today is actually sandwiched between two very similar stories of a showdown between David and Shaul. So just to kind of remind us what's happening in the Sefer, um, David has had a falling out of sorts with Shaul. Shaul is trying to kill him. He fears that David is trying to take his throne. He has painted David as the bad guy in the story, right? The, the son-in-law who's trying to stage a coup, who's trying to, trying to take over. Um, and Shaul, Shaul is out to get him. David's response, or the pro-David kind of you know, PR campaign would be, no, David has been unjustly accused. David only wants peace. He has no um, interest in taking the throne until Shaul dies a peaceful death that uh, you know, may have asked him. And he has no intentions of taking the throne um, by sword. Um, and, but because Shaul is out to get him, he's been running away. So the two stories that are sandwiched around our story, just to give us a little context, the first one is where David actually has a chance to kill Shaul. Um, there's a whole scene in the cave um, in En Gedi, right, where Shaul kind of enters the cave and David is already there. Um, and instead of where Shaul goes to, to use a bathroom in the cave, he doesn't realize it's actually where um, David and his soldiers have been hiding. David's soldiers tell him, this is definitely a sign from Hashem, right? God wants you to kill him. He, Shaul has fallen into your hands. And David says, no. Halilali, that I should touch Mashiach Hashem, right? Chas v'shalom, that I should touch um, Shaul, and he refuses to do that, but he does go and cut his cloak, right? Then there's a whole kind of like showdown between David and Shaul where they yell at each other, and David kind of yells and says, look, I could have killed you, and I didn't. Isn't this proof that I'm not trying to kill you? And Shaul's like, you're right, you're right. I promise I'll stop trying to kill you, which isn't true, because then two parrots later, again, like there's still some kind of uh, chasing of David that's going on. This time, David and one of his soldiers sneak into a camp. This is in Midbar Tzif. This is in the parrot after the one we're going to read. The same kind of almost exact language, and we'll talk about kind of like, again, why the story seems to almost repeat itself a little bit uh, with a few, a few distinctions. This time, uh, Shaul is sleeping. David and his soldiers sneak in. They don't kill Shaul, but again, the soldier's like, David, I'll do it. He's right here. God wants me. God clearly wants you to be able to kill him. He's fallen into your hands. David says, no, I'm not going to do it. But they steal his spear, his water jug. They go to like a cliff where it's safe, and they're like, hey, Shaul, you know, wake up. And then they have a whole kind of um, fighting, like kind of a, a, a shouting match a little bit again, where David says, you've been trying to kill me all this time, and look. I had the opportunity to kill you and I didn't. And Shaul says, yes, yes, my son, you're right. I'll stop, I'll stop kind of bothering you. And at that point, he really does stop trying to chase him and kill him. But again, it's interesting that that's just the context that's given around our story, bracketing our story. And we'll see as we read through it, why this may be important as well to understand where David's coming from psychologically and where and what he's hearing, kind of the different responses that he's given. So that's kind of our background so far. So what we're going to do now is we're going to read through the story together. And again, we're trying to keep in mind um, the story of David and Bathsheba. Um, and just to think, you know, where do we hear kind of under underpinnings or, or just hints to the story of David and Bathsheba? I just just quickly, uh, in case we're, we are more familiar or less familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba, I should just, just learn this with my 12th grade Gemara class. So it's fresh in my mind, so just summarize it quickly. Or as we know, David, this is much later on, David stays back from battle. He does not go into battle. He sees Bathsheba bathing. He sleeps with her. He gets her pregnant. His first plan is actually... Um, to solve the to solve this whole potential scandal that might come out is he brings her husband back from the battle and tries to encourage him. Anyone remember to do what? Uria. Go home. Right. He encourages Uria. Go home. You know, and and relax. We'll give you some time off, hoping that Uria will sleep with Bathsheba, and then the paternity of the son will be covered up. Right. And everything, no one will have to know, and everything will be fine. Unclear from the story whether Uria suspects something or not. It's actually written in a very kind of ambiguous way, but Uria refuses to go down back to Bathsheba and, uh, and be with his wife, right? He says, you know, chas v'shalom, that, that, you know, uh, like, it would be inappropriate for me to, you know, go back and, you know, relax with, okay, um, relax with, relax, you know, in my house and eat and drink and sleep with my wife when all the soldiers are, like, camped out on the, you know, in the, in the field. Almost sounds a little bit like a dig to David, right? That David is also relaxing in the palace when everyone else is kind of out, out in, like, the, the army camps. Um, and he doesn't go back. Um, so David realizes the scandal is not going to be covered up, and he actually jumps to trying to get Uria out of the way. And he has Yoah put Uria at the front of the battle, mm -hmm. where Uria is killed. Um, and then um, after a mourning period subsides, David goes and marries Bathsheba legally. Um, and then we know that Tana Navi comes and really yells at David, saying this was totally inappropriate, no, God has never said to him. Not yelling, not yeah, sorry, yeah. Then Atan comes and yells at him, because the whole mashal of the keves, right, of like the, mm -hmm. the rich man, the poor man, the sheep. And, and basically from then on, um, almost as punishment, David admits that he sins, says Khatati, and the rest of Shmuel Bet, basically David's kind of kingdom starts to fall apart, right? All of his sons rebel, there's a lot of really terrible things, and it's kind of a, a downward spiral. So that's kind of like, definitely David and Bathsheba sin super bad, leads to a lot of 
kind of like the falling apart of David's kingdom, more or less till we get to the time period of Shlomo. So what we're doing now is trying to find the, the origins of this story and our story of David Nabal Abiyah. Okay, so we're going to go to the English and Hebrew translations over here. Um, you can follow along in Hebrew or in English. I'm going to read uh, mostly in Hebrew, and we'll, we'll skip a little bit here and there, just have a chance to kind of read through what's going on in this story. So, the first positive that we are told to start off our parak, by Yamat Shmuel, by Kapsu, Kol Yisrael, by Shadu, Lo, by Gruber, by Tobar, Rama, by Yakam, David, by Yeret, El Midbar, Karak. The first thing we are told is that Shmuel Hanavi dies. Um, why might this be important to understand? Why might this have an effect on David psychologically? that Shmuel Hanavi has died. Any thoughts? Any thoughts uh, that anyone wants to share us so that? Like, why might the death of a Navi affect, affect David? Well, Shmuel was clearly the strong leader in, in Israel. Um, with his passing, and I'm, unless there's somebody who's able to fill his shoes, mm -hmm. um, people, like a... will, uh, people are can, can be unchecked when they okay. shouldn't be. Good. So we'll see also when it's like a power vacuum, what can happen. So that actually is very similar if we want to look in the sources at the end onto source number one. Uh, this is on the second last page, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Rabbi Yosef Parash, he says something very similar to what you said. And he says again, why mention kind of the, the, the death of Shmuel here? I'll read it in Hebrew. El Lehodia, Ilu Hayah Shmuel Kayam. Well, we're going to see in this parak that David gets extremely angry at Naval, threatens to kill him, almost wipes out his entire family. Very similar to what you said, they're saying that without, if Shmuel had been alive, David would have checked his passions a little bit more. That almost everyone behaves better when there's a Navi. But almost when you take away the Navi, when there's almost this power vacuum, People will act a little bit unchecked. Right? I'm a teacher, so I know it's like it was a day that I'm not here. Yeah, but it was also it was total chaos, right? Just people like bouncing yes, off the walls. Yes, Sometimes yes, you don't yes. want to in class, you know? So like so how the home like you have here without a Navi, there's going to be there's going to be kind of unrest. So that's kind of one approach that I think is important for us to understand going into it. Another interesting thing to think about is at this point, there are a lot of kind of different statements being made or different kind of arguments or slogans being thrown around about David's motivations. Like if there was a newspaper back then that you could read, and you were reading the different op-eds that were being written, there were definitely op-eds that were being written by the pro-David camp that were saying, you know, as we said earlier, right, David is here to, you know, he has no, does not want to harm Sha Shaul, he wishes Shaul a healthy life until 120, until he, as the, you know, as, as the son-in-law of the king, will take over the throne because Yonatan has already told him that he's willing to, to work for him. That's what the pro be, the op-eds they'd be writing. But if you're from the Shaul camp, what are you writing in your op-eds? Well, who's David? He's a, he's a traitor. He's trying to take the throne like he's a rebel. He deserves to die. So there's a lot of kind of that language that's going on. What's interesting is we know, as the reader, because Sefer Shmuel is obviously being written right to defend you know, David's perspective, we know that David actually has been anointed right, by God to be the next king, and Shaul has basically been fired by God for the different sins that he does, right, for not killing Amalek, for everything like that. But what do we know about the ceremony where David was anointed? You know, remember? It was what? It was... It was in secret, right? No one else really was there, right? It was the whole scene of David and his older brothers, right? And like, Shmuel, the first thinks the older brothers should be chosen. But the only person who can really give legitimacy to David's, to David's kingdom is who? Only Shmuel. Because remember, it was public, unlike Shaul, no one else saw this. We're taking Shmuel's word for it, which is fine, but Shmuel is, is a heavyweight. He's a Navi. But now that Shmuel has died, I think that you could probably argue that if you are David, that you have just lost, you're, you're feeling now that your cause just got maybe a little bit less legitimate, right? That even though you know you're in the right, there's, Shmuel is not there anymore to kind of defend you, to kind of back you up and say, no, no, I was there, God shows him. So again, maybe this could explain why David gets a little bit more sensitive as we read through the parak when people start to question um, his legitimacy as a future ruler, his legitimacy um, in, in rebelling a little bit against Shaul. So things to think about also, just kind of giving that context. Okay, so that's kind of like the intro that we're given. And now, it introduces us to some more characters. So, we go to Pasuk Bet. It tells us about a few other people. So, we hear about a person living in Ma'on. So, we're told about a person in Ma'on um, who has a lot of things going on in Carmel, and he is very, very rich and has lots of stuff. Pasuk Gimel. 
V'shem ha'ish naval, v'shem ishto Abigail. Va'isha tovat seichel ve'ifat tohar, va'ish kashev v'rama al-alim v'hu kalbi. So then we hear their names, right? It's almost like, again, um, very kind of exaggerated, where the person's name is Naval, and his wife's name is Abigail. And what do we say about the wife? What is she? She is beautiful and smart and wise. But she's clearly Tanakh. It's interesting, because often in Tanakh, right, um, the, the Tanakh, the Navi who's running, or the, or the narrator, won't really tell us um, objectively about a person. They'll let, let their deeds kind of like talk about whether they're good or not. But here, it's already weighing in. Shmuel is weighing in and saying, right, no, Abigail, good. And Naval, we're saying here, is not, right? Kashev Ram Ali, he's bad, he's a bad guy, we don't like him. What's interesting also is Naval, it comes up later, right? His name, we want to think about the etymology of his name, right? Naval means kind of disgusting. And what's interesting also is Kalbi could mean that he's descended from, from Kalev, but yeah. the Radak, I believe, also says it could be a play on what? Kalev, right? Like we're already saying, Abigail, good, Naval, bad. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, and we know Naval is very rich. Pazu Dal. So what's going to happen now is David hears that Naval is basically having a sheep shearing festival. There's going to be lots of food. David and his men are basically kind of like running around. He's like, you know, they're, they're trying to help different people as they can, but they're basically trying to live off whatever they can. And he realizes here's an opportunity to have his soldiers get a good meal. So he sends some messengers to talk to Naval. Go greet Naval and wish him peace in my name. So already sounds very deferential. Peace to everyone. Everything should be great. All right. Oh, we just read that. Sorry. So in Pasuk Zion, David actually lets us in on what has been going on. But basically, apparently, his soldiers were protecting the shepherds of Nabal this whole time. And he's like, and we didn't abuse them. We took good care of them. Nothing was lost. We're just letting you know that we are protecting your, your shepherds. On Pasuk Zion, so now, you have like a celebration, give us some food. Okay, so a couple of things to think about um, over here. Or actually, you know, let's just read Naval's response, and then we will kind of unpack it. So, on Pasuk Tet, the Narim come, they talk to Naval. On Pasuk Yud, we get Naval's response. By Ya'an Naval is Avdei David, by Yomer. Mi David umi ben Ishai. Uh, right, so he, Naval is not a fan of this. He's like, who, who is David and who is this Ben Isha that I'm going to help him out? Not just that, he says, there's a lot of slaves today that are rebelling against their masters. So we're going to see this is an important, an important line, right? And then he goes on to say, like, really, I'm going to give food to these people? It's not happening. Um, that goes back to David, and we'll talk, we'll see David's response in a second, but let's unpack um, this scenario here. So, First of all, interesting to think a little bit about David's actions. David basically says that he was kind of protecting the shepherds. Um, what do we think about that? Like, what do we think that that's something that justifies David asking for food? Could we read this maybe in a little bit of a different way? Any thoughts? Any reactions? Any reactions to this? What does this sound like? Where David's like, "Yeah, we were protecting. We were protecting your shepherds. Now pay up." Like, how does this? Um, any thoughts? Yeah. The, the, the English seems clear enough, but when you're reading the Hebrew. At least to me, yeah. it was not quite clear what was going on. Right. No, and I, I think that right on one end was this. First what? of all, we're never told that this was like a contract deal, right? Yeah. Was this really that everyone? Yeah, we had a contract. You know, we 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 washed your your sheep, your shepherds, and now you have to pay up them all. Maybe it was a little bit like I'm thinking of <laughs> um, guys. What do you call them? Mafia guys who want protection? Yeah, that's what I was trying to lead into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will throw my stone through your right. window if right. you don't. So I think on one end we can read this as a contract, and, and yeah. you know, and David's getting you know um, pushed or like reneged on here out of a contract, and he's, he's justifiably upset. Or was this like the mafia, right? So it comes up in all these TV shows where people bang on doors. They're like, oh yeah, we're gonna protect you, mm. right? Pay up, and you don't really have an option to say no to that protection money. So again, that also already is kind of putting David in a more mafia, uh, more abrupt kind of way over here. Um, but what's interesting over here, where Bazak kind of points this out, is if we read it the other way, I think it, it leaves it ambiguous, but if you read it as kind of maybe there was a deal, um, what other story in Tanakh does this sound like where someone was watching someone's sheep and then they get messed over from their deal? 
and think like Parshana Shavua. It sounds <laughs> good, right? Yaakov and Lavan. Very good. And he points out that here, there seems to be a parallel to Yaakov and Lavan, but here, David is who in the story? David is Yaakov, right? He's the guy, the nice guy, he's being deferential, he just wants to do his job. And Naval is like the evil Lavan that's happening. And that's maybe one way, at this point, perhaps to see David in a positive light. Though I want us to also remember, it does kind of sound a little mafia esque, right? They're like, I don't know if this is like, David is so innocent in this. Um, but one thing to think about, yeah. The Naval, if you switch the lens yeah. of Naval, you have Laval. Oh, wonderful, there you go, great. Very fascinating, great. Very nice. Right, they're already kind of like, it's, it's like, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, it's all set up. There you go. Um, okay, so that's already, we're seeing kind of like David. But now I think what's interesting about Naval's response, right, is Naval, is Naval just being a miser, right? But is he also kind of saying something political? I think like that's what we're going to see what really yeah. annoys, or not annoys, like really sets David off is this idea of you know there are so many slaves today rebelling against their masters and he's basically questioning like he's questioning David's yeah. legitimacy right that you're not he's basically he's the one who's reading you know the the pro he's donating to the pro Shaul campaign right he's the one who re writing the or reading the Shaul uh, pro Shaul op-eds right that puts David in a very negative light and we're gonna and building this uh, like adding this on to the fact that Shmuel just died when David hears this he is going to kind of, you know, flip out a little bit. And that's what we're going to see now in the Pesuki. So what is David's response to this? Pesuki Yudgimel, the last Pesuk on this page. Vayomer, David la'anashav, chigru isha karbo, vayfru isha karbo, vayfru gam David karbo, vayalu akharei David ke arba me'od ish umatayim yashbu al kili. David tells everyone, arm up, go to war, right? And everyone, they take 400 men, and they're going to march on the Val with intentions to do what? This comes up later, but what do you think he's going to do? Kill, right? Kill everyone. Later on, he actually mentions to Abigail, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, he doesn't mention explicitly here, but like, I would have left, like, if you had stopped me, I would have killed everyone. So, let's read a little bit more about now how Abigail gets involved, and we'll see how this thing, this actually sounds like a different Tanakh story. So, how's it be So now, um, this seems to be something that Naval also seems to have, like, annoyed lots of people. It seems to be something that happened um, many times, perhaps, because um, Naval's servant runs to Abigail. It was almost like, oh, he did it again. So, how's it be um, so the next page now. Well, Abigail, Ishet Naval, he gave Nara Chadim and Nari and Lemor. He named Shalat David, Malafim, Abid Barlo, Barach, Adonayim, Vayakahem. You know, and the servant is telling me the whole story. You know, David sent messengers to help us out. Vayashim Tovim Lanu Maod, Vlo Hikavanu, Vlo Pakadu Mivma. So he basically repeats what David said. So it seems that really David was helping them out. He's like David was such a good guy. He helped us out, and everything was fine. Um, and we'll just skip a little bit to Pasuk Yud Zayin. Um, the Ata Deiri Matasi ki kalta harayla donenu bel kol beto who ben bliel medaber ela like you know your husband like he just started yelling at these people again and caused all this trouble and now evil is going to come to all of us basically you know you can't David is not this you know pacifist you can't you know insult David and not expect there to be severe repercussions even though that is also <coughs> problematic and he's like now look what happened. So now, what is Abigail going to do to save the day? So Pasuk Yudchet, she prepares, basically, at the end of the day, David's men were what? They were hungry. So let's bring them some food. So, Pasuk Yudchet, Batimaher Abigail, Batikach Matayim Lecha, Mishnah Nibli Yayin, Bechamesh Tzorah Asuyot, Bechamesh Sheim Kali, 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 And she loads up the camels with a feast. Bechamesh Sheim Kali, 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 Bechamesh Right, secret, she's not telling her husband about this. And number two, she's basically sending this mincha, this offering first, and she's gonna follow um, afterwards, right? They keep going. And finally, David and Abigail meet. And we'll talk about their dialogue in a second. What story in Tanakh are we now reminded of? Yeah, when Yaakov and Asaph meet. Right, Yaakov now, right, 400 the men, mincha. right, yeah. sending a mincha, and passing yeah. it, yeah. passing in front. Yeah. So now, we switch from Yaakov and Lavan to Yaakov and Esau, wow. and who is David parallel to now? He's not. He's not the, the Yaakov guy anymore, Ab right? Abigail. Abigail is more yeah. like Yaakov, right? Setting the mincha, and David marching with the four hundred men. Esau. He's being parallel to Esau, Esau. Esau, right? So already, I think this is purposeful, right? Written yeah. into the story for us to kind of see that you know David's reaction here does seem to be an overreaction. Does seem to be something that's that it's Esau like right. what he's doing now. Um, this is again a thing that Rabbi Bazak points out in his in his shiri. Okay, so so far we've kind of segued across, we've seen like, kind of how David's character has, has passed along. Let's see now, what does Abigail do to talk him down? And why is this going to be important? And then we'll look at a, kind of a few ways to kind of reframe the story. So, um, 
Here we go. So we'll skip to, um, we'll skip down a little bit to um, Pasuk. Pasuk 23, oh, sorry, in Pasuk Chabed, it's just where David says, he's like muttering to himself, like what he's going to do to Naval. Pasuk Chabed, like, Ko yase lokim lavavai David, v'ko yosik, yimashir mikola asher lo vada boker mashtim bakir. If I leave any male alive by morning, like, so help me God, like that's not, you know, like, if I, if I leave anyone alive. Meaning he plans to go in, he's going to wipe out everyone. Okay, and now Abigail meets him, and she's going to try to talk him down. So first, Pasuk Chagim, well, the first thing she does, she bows down to him. So already, kind of being very deferential. We'll see this is important also. Um, like, please, you know, it's my fault. Like, just listen to what I'm going to say. Sorry, She's like, my husband is a terrible guy, he's a jerk, like his name is Naval, and he is Naval, he's disgusting. It's, it, it's, if your servants had come to me, this would have been a totally different story. Like, it's a mis miscommunication, misunderstanding, miscommunication, and my husband's a jerk. Okay, so Pasuk Chavav. Um, so first she like, goes secondly in the puzzle, she blesses him, you know, all your enemies should be destroyed. But then she also says, you know, throwing this in, like God so far has held you back from doing what? From, from committing, right, from killing you, from committing bloodshed. And one of the themes we're going to see here, it's important with Abigail, is she's basically trying to remind David who he really is. She's basically trying to say, you know, you're not someone who kills indiscriminately. Like, God has stopped you from that. Like, this isn't something that you do. Um, um, yeah. I know she's being very, what was the word you used? Oh, differential, maybe? But maybe. sometimes I worried if she weren't, if she, maybe I'm looking at it from today's point of view, yeah. sometimes it seems like she was self-abasing, even. Yeah. Interesting, yeah, but I, I think she's doing it on purpose. Like, she's yeah. doing this, right, because yeah. she's thinking, like, what's the best way to, to talk W down? Yeah. Right, yeah. what does he need? And, right, I don't think it's, a, it's putting David in a very positive light, but almost, David's, like, Kabul has been insulted, right? He feels, and we'll see also, like, perhaps he feels he's been disrespected as, like, a member of a post, someone who should be treated like a king, even if he's not a king yet. So she's trying to kind of, like, give him that honor, or trying to talk, talk mm -hmm. him down. But, yeah, but also, also the point. So if we turn the page over, we'll see also, she, she goes on and on, this whole speech, um, and how, you know, Hashem should, should bless him and fight the wars for him. Um, here we go. Um, yeah, so we'll see that a little bit. To Pasuk Lamed, Pasuk 30. Vaya, so after the end of her speech, she says, Vaya ki yase Hashem la Adoni kechol asher tiberi hatova alecha v'tzivcha la nagid al Yisrael. So she already is explicitly acknowledging you will be the next king. So she's already telling him, you know, like, you know, people might have, you know, you might have felt a little bit insulted about your legitimacy. I, you're going to be my next king. I'm in the pro David camp. Um, and here comes the important part, Pasuk Lamed Alf. V'lo tiye zot lecha lefuka v'lecha mechshol le. Don't let this be a stumbling block to you. Meaning, don't come and wipe out Naval's house. This is going to be a stain on your reputation. So, for you to come and spill blood now, David, like, don't, this is going to be a stumbling block. You're going to regret this. It's going to be a stain on your future kingdom. And I'm acknowledging that you're going to be king one day. And at the end, she kind of throws in, and when you become king, you should remember me. Remember your handmaid. A little ambiguous. We'll see kind of. Some parsing later on, they try to figure out like what exactly she's saying. Remember me, like what's going on over here. Well, that's basically the argument she makes. David is totally responsive to this. Pasuk Lamedal, Ve'yomar David Lavigal, Baruch Hashem Melech Yisrael Asher Shalcha Hayom Hazel Ekrati. Thank you, blesses God that sent you to me. Baruch Tamech Ubracha Atz Asher Kalatani Hayom Hazem Ibo B'Tamim Vashi Yadili. You thank you so much for stopping me from committing terrible murders. Like you stopped me from committing um, bloodshed. If you hadn't stopped me, he says in Pastor Lama Dog, there wouldn't have been anyone left by morning. I would have killed everyone. And, and you were the one who stopped me. Um, and basically, just to summarize the rest of the story, she said, he says, okay, go home. We're good. Um, so she goes home, Pastor Lama Dog. Um, obviously, Naval has been parting it up, and he is drunk. And Pastor Lama Dog, the Boa Vigal, Naval, Vinello, Mishter, Veto, Kimishter, Hamela. Interesting, he writes like, like, a, like um, a feast of the king. She's alright, he's drunk, not fantato now. In the morning, next pasuk, she tells him exactly what she did, 
you know, shows them the, the credit card bills, I guess, of like all the, of all the, the fee space that went. It involves hard parts to to stone. Seems like he has some, some sort of heart attack. And 10 days later, Pasuk Lam Effect, he dies. By Go Hashem and Naval Vayimo, right? That God kind of intervenes and he dies. Um, David hears this, and David's like, oh, okay, I'm single now, right? So then, in Pasuk Lam Effect, after like a time has passed, um, he goes and he sends for her, right? This is the end of Pasuk Lam Effect. And he, um, and he marries her, and basically she becomes his wife, and they live happily ever after, more or less. And that's basically <laughs> our story, Hi, everybody. Right? Kind of has the whole trap at the end. We are all like, together in the NPR. Please come right away. You do not want to miss it. All sophomores come to NPR. Everybody else, be connected. And that basically is the end of our story. And a fabulous musical presentation. A lot to unpack. And 12th graders, you also have your regular math Thanks. We're going to take, I want to I wanna kind of talk about three possible approaches to read this story and to kind of like see how this is playing out. But first, does anyone have any reactions, anything that surprised you about the story, anything you wanted to, and you wanted to share, any questions about Abigail's motivations, about the bee's motivations? Any thoughts? If not, but we can we can keep thinking of anything that, that you know is bothering you or anything with the story, like feel free to, to share it and kind of bring it up. Well, yeah. If her husband was such a lousy guy, won't well, yeah. she bother defending him anyway? Good point. Him. Good point. I That's think here, was, yeah, it was probably more she wanted to, you know, it's almost like, I'm all the bad guy, but all of the servants are going to get killed, right? So she's trying oh, okay. right, to protect she's her household, to but you're right. I don't, I don't think that she is definitely wanting to, uh, I don't think she's definitely wanting to protect Naval in this uh -huh. case. Okay. Um, so, it, yeah. Uh, the Pasuk the Memzal, which, which doesn't have an English translation, but it's very troublesome. Oh, yeah. And Shaul took his daughter. Oh, yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. And he married her off to someone, uh, someone yes. else. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. that's actually, yes. Um, it's fascinating. It yeah, I, I guess what that's that? over here. In re retribution for Dutch. So I think in general it was, I would say it's, a lot of it I think it has to do with retribution. Also I think is Shaul trying to sever any legitimacy that David would have to the throne. Right, David's legitimate claim is that he is the son-in-law of the king. Right? He's married to Michal, um, and it would have been it would have been perfect. Right, it's like <coughs> Yonatan really is the crown prince, but Yonatan is explicitly <coughs> says that he wants <coughs> to resign and have David take it. Please, but if David is no longer married to, to Michal, because she's given to someone else, then David has no claim to the throne at all. If you see that, like, it, please, that please that. bring it to the office or give it directly <laughs> to her. Okay, so meaning I think what Shaul is trying to do here is to, to cut David out. Like it's Does a Michal know this? I mean, um, I mean, <laughs> right, so it actually ends up being, um, what's interesting is later on, um, right, we're actually never really told, we're told that Michal loved David, but we're never really told kind of a lot of, a lot of other things. What ends up happening later on is when David comes back, you know, and, and takes over as king, he actually demands that Michal return to him. Um, and what seems ambiguous about that also is, is it because he still loves her, or is it because he wants to unite everyone under his throne? And if you want legitimacy, you have, you have to have you have to be married to the you have to have some connection to Beit Shaul, and she as she's being returned, Palti Ben Yaish return is like walking after her, like crying, and it's like this really terrible terrible scene um, about how like she's returned. And then after we know like from different interactions between her and David later on, they don't like where David is dancing and Michal yells at him. It doesn't always seem to be the best. A little bit of a contentious uh, relationship, but yeah, but also kind of a, we're not going to deal with it so much in this year, but but fascinating kind of what goes on. And yeah. He, and when he takes Abigail, he takes another wife. Yeah. So that's also the thing. It's like Abi, to me, has lots of wives at this point, and it's also kind of like right after the king or, or a tribal chief. Um, I saw a hand over here. Yes. How can he take Michal back if she was married to someone else? So right. So I guess you could also say, how was she allowed to to um, you know even be to, to marry Paltiel in the first place? I mean, I assume there was some kind of forced divorce in both cases, like kind of like for either forcing Paltiel. I, I think we're far too talking about either forcing um, or I don't know whether Shaul like annuls the marriage just feels like he has the power to do that, or if he, because, right, we don't hear David giving uh, a formal divorce to Michal in this case, um, and later on, I guess, with Paltiel, David, I mean, I, I assume, is it putting a lot of pressure on Paltiel to allow, even though Paltiel is, like, following along and crying, I sure, I assume there's pressure being put on Paltiel to end that marriage also. Well, halakhically, he can't take her back when she was married. Halakhically, he can't take her true. back when she's married. True, yeah, no, that's interesting. I'm wondering, if you, right, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, kind of what the halakha justification was. I, or you could have, maybe you could have said it before the baby went to, I, I know lots of people say before someone goes to war, maybe he gets a divorce or not, but I, I, I think it's murky on purpose. I think, I, I'm sure, like, I, I don't know offhand, but I'm sure it's been far too much deal with kind of like, how luckily how, how it could work. But I definitely don't think this is being portrayed as like ideal. Like, I think there's a lot of kind of like, like again, I think it's 
playing like fast and loose with with the, with the marriage, the institution of marriage here for political for political reasons. You know, I think on, on both sides, which is which isn't something that's positive. Um, yeah, so I, I think yeah, it's very tro troubling both morally and troubling philosophically um, as well. Um, yeah, so these are great questions, and you know, I'm I'm sure we can talk about them more. Um, I wanted to though just present like few approaches talking about the story of David Abnaval and Abigail. So um, the first thing that I wanted to I wanted to kind of point out was what exactly is Abigail's goal here in talking David, um, David down. And I think for that, it's important to kind of come back to the chart we saw before, which is chart number two, and to remind ourselves that this story, as we mentioned much earlier, is really con is, is really sandwiched between two times where David kill could have killed Shaul and didn't. And I think one way of seeing this, and a lot of the different Bible scholars that I, I gave you their, their, um, their sources at the end, point out that really what is the goal of having this story in the middle here? Because when Abigail is talking David down, her goal is basically to remind David about how to be his best self. And she's almost reminding him, like, David, look back in your Tanakh to the previous parak, right? And, like, we know that you're someone who doesn't, right? God has stopped you from committing bloodshed. We know you had a chance to commit bloodshed in the last parak. You could have killed Shaul. And you even might have been justified in doing it, right? He was trying to kill you. But even though that you was in your right to do it, what did you say? You said, Halila, that I should touch Mashiach Hashem, that I'm not going to, I'm not going to kill the king. This is not who I am, it's not what I'm about. I think what's interesting here is David is so angry and he's so upset with what Naval says, right? When Naval kind of questions his legitimacy, that he's almost like he's just seeing red, right? He just wants to go out and get out his anger through violence. And, and Abigail is able to remind him, you know, David. Who are you deep down? This is not who you are. This is not. This is not what you're about. What you're about is not committing bloodshed. You you held yourself back with Shaul, and you can hold yourself back here. I think that's why David is so responsive to her because he realizes, yeah, this isn't what I'm about. Like this is not who I am. This is not my best self. And she's able to kind of remind him about who he really wants to be and who he has been in the past. Um, and um, what's interesting with this is Rav Mordechai Sabato, who I had a chance to, to learn in Matan in the summers, the past few summers, and he gave a shiur on this topic, and he actually pointed out that why do we have almost the story repeat itself in the next parrot, where David has a chance again to kill Shaul and doesn't, and you know, people who are academic, Bible critics have a have appeal day with this, you know, what is this, like two, like the same story maybe portrayed, you know, in two different ways, mm -hmm. so he says no, Rav Sabato says these are two kind of fundamentally different stories, and why does the story need to repeat itself, because David basically, in the first interaction, when he doesn't kill Shaul, David passes the test. But now in our parak, with Naval and Abigail, when David gets so tempted to, to, to you know, become so volatile and almost kills everyone else, Rav Sabato says David has almost regressed. He's regressed a little bit in his character growth because now he was willing, when he was angry, to do what? To kill everyone. So he needs to have another interaction with Shaul in the next parak where he's going to say what? Where he can say now, again, I'm not going to kill Shaul to show that he's come full circle, to show that he's done Shuva Gemurah, to show that he's been able to kind of internalize the lessons that Abigail um, taught him and to return to who he really is, that he's not someone who commits bloodshed. That's not just like Abigail taught him up a ledge, but he's going to do it again. But now we see he's really internalized it because he had another test where he could commit violence, and he did it. So that's like the first approach. Abigail is reminding uh, David who he really is deep down and who he wants to be as a king. Um, the second approach brings us back to our original question, which is of David and Bathsheba. And there's a lot of parallels between the story. For this, we'll look at chart number one, where I gave you kind of like a more expansive kind of parallels between these two stories. First of all, we just have a lot of similar milim, or, or milim um, um, that are coming up between um, both these stories. And both of them, the drunkenness comes up, sword, secrecy, peace, right? The whole thing of whether it's, you know, um, um, when Uriah is brought back and David's like, oh, you know, like, how are you? How's peace? Everything. And, and the whole first deferential greeting he gives towards Nabal, everything's in secret, right? Um, David's told by, by Natan with David and Bathsheba, like, you sinned in secret, and now people are going to take your wives in public. And here we know that um, with the story of, of Abigail, she's going secretly, right, against, uh, against her husband. And both of them is clear clear things of violence and of the harab, and both of you have drunkenness, either Naval gets drunk or Oria is, like, David tries to get him drunk, right, to make him go home, even though he doesn't, he still refuses to go home. Um, both of them use messengers, and both of them, there's an interest in a married woman, explicitly with Bathsheba, and with Abigail, it's a little bit unclear, we're looking at a Gemara that tries to paint almost a different story here, um, but it is interesting, you know, like, they have this interaction, and, like, very quickly after, David, you know, um, you know proposes to her and wants to institute marriage. Um, so we'll talk about that. In both of these cases, there's betrayal of a married man, 
Right, David betrays Uriah and sleeps with Bathsheba. And here, Abigail betrays Naval, going behind his back to help David. Um, and both of them, what's interesting is the wives later on, um, even when they're no longer married, when, when they're, even when they become married to David, are always referred to as the wives of their original husband. And we'll see how that might be like an implicit review. Clearly in the story of David and Bathsheba, it calls Bathsheba Ashik Uriah, which is for sure purposeful, you know, like telling David, you know, like this was, it was Ashik Uriah, you know, that you took. This wasn't just a single woman. Like you took someone who was doing marriage to someone else. Um, and later on, it says Abigail, Ashik Navala Carmelites, right? And it's just the same kind of, we'll see that maybe later on, we'll look at a, a Midrash, and again, I, again, almost there was something somewhat inappropriate about so soon after David, you know, taking Abigail, perhaps, is one way to read it. And finally, what's interesting in the, in the Gemara actually tries to justify the, is only one approach, right? They like tries to defend David, both in what happens with Uriah, and later on with Naval, one of those Gemaras we'll look at now, by saying that the person was Moret or Malchut, the person deserved it. That either Uriah um, sinned against David because he disobeyed a direct command, or he was disrespectful to David and saying that Yoab really was re really his master and not David. And here too, perhaps, that Naval, by insulting David, was Moret or Malchut. So we see kind of like, a lot of themes between these stories. Um, but again, um, what is kind of the purpose of Abigail in this? Once we see all these perils, why is David kind of held back from sinning in this case, but not in the story of David and Bathsheba? For this, I want to show you a fascinating Gemara in Megillah, which is source number two. We turn the page over in source number two. Mm -hmm. um, a fascinating Gemara that basically takes the story that we just read and tries to superimpose a whole different Midrashic read onto that story, which obviously is still a Midrash, but I think it's, it's trying to get to certain truths that are, that are there, perhaps, in the Pshat. So we'll read part of it together. Um, what it starts off is it says that when um, Abigail came to David, um, she wasn't coming to plead for her life. She actually was coming to ask him a question in Hochuk Nida, to ask him a family purity law. Um, and the Gemara starts off, and it says, so we, she comes to ask a question about Hilchot Nida, and David's response to her is, the third line, do we, do we answer Nida questions at night? We don't answer Nida questions at night. She yells back at him, right? This was basically some kind of trigger, right? And she said, like, to, like almost to, to get him to say that, she says back, Do we also judge, you know, capital cases at night? Meaning you've clearly judged Naval and his in his entire household to death, were you allowed to do that at night? Why are you allowed to do that at night? And he responds, Amr la, Moreb Malchut No, he was Moreb Malchut, he rebelled against the king, and therefore he's, he is deserves to die. So what question can we immediately say back? What's the problem with that? He's not the king. David is not the king, right, exactly. And that's exactly what Abigail says back to him. Uh, right, so it says, right, Moreb Malchut have Amr lo, she replies to him, Adayin Shaul Kayam, right, exactly as you said, right, um, you haven't checked the newspaper. Shaul is still alive. You are not the king yet. You are not the king. And I think this is a little bit different. Our first approach was Abigail reminding David that who he really is. He's not someone who commits wanted acts of violence. And now she's basically reminding him, you're not the king yet. You can't act like the king when you're not the king. And not only that, what's going to develop now is even though you're not supposed to be acting like the king, and you are, you're acting like the worst type of king, right? And, she, and he... Um, so again, she's, she's reminding him over here that, you know, Shaul is kayam, Shaul is alive, you're not allowed to act this way. Amar la, baruch tamech ubrucha at asher kalatani hayom azem evo bedamim. David blesses her and says, you know, just like in the Peshat, thank you, you know, you stopped me from committing murder. Um, but now, it kind of takes the story in a different, in a different way. It kind of diverges a little bit from the Peshat. And says that basically, um, that Abigail reveals herself a little bit to David, and he then basically, um, uh, he basically then um, asks her to sleep with him, right? And it says, Amr la kishmi ali. And she basically, he basically turns to her and says, you know, sleep with me, which is, again, not explicit in the text at all, but the Gemara is kind of trying to read it, that perhaps there was a certain element of interest or some kind, something that was going on in the story. But listen to what she says back. Amr lo, lo zot lecha lefuka. Right, this was the language that we saw in the shot, right? Don't let this be a stumbling block. The shot is, don't let this be a stumbling block. What's the stumbling block? That you shouldn't kill Nabal's whole family. The Gemara and Megillah reinterpreted that the stumbling block should be, don't sleep with me now and commit adultery. Don't let this be an, uh, an adulteress. Don't let this don't let this be a stumbling block to you. Now the Gemara uses, you know, very Gemari language, kind of just a close reading of this possible says, Zot, why does it say this should not be a stumbling block for you? Zot miklal de ika akarite. Because this implies this should not be a stumbling block for you, but there will be something else that will be a stumbling block for you. And what was, what's that going to be? 
The story of Bat Sheva, right, exactly, right? Uma Nihu, Ma said to Bat Sheva, Umas Kana Hachi Hame. And this is exactly what happened. So basically, what we're told kind of here by the Gemara was there was potential in this story, the explicit potential in the shot of murder, but the Midrash picks up and says there was also potential for adultery, right? And both of them, it almost happened, but Abigail talks to be down from it. And I think here is again this idea of, of character traits, of character traits that are inherently positive, right? Charisma, power, wanting to defend people, but can also go down a dark path. And here Abigail is reminded to be that you are not king yet. You do not have the right to act like a king. No one is more red than the Malfoot against you because you are not king. Um, you will be one day, but you're not now. And think carefully about how you want to define yourself as a king. Like, A, you're not a king, and B, the way you're acting now is not how kings should be acting. So again, I think we see the power of Abigail to really talk to be down off the ledge. Um, I want to conclude with just one or two other kind of approaches that kind of touch upon David psychologically, which I think are fascinating as well. So the first one, if we go back to, oh, I'm sorry, just one more point on that. If you turn the page over, um, it's the last source, the Midrash Shmuel actually points out that we write Abigail's name without a vav, and it says that that's actually done on purpose because there was something almost in, remember what she said, like, remember your maidservant? That there was something slightly inappropriate about that, that it wasn't appropriate for her as a married woman, even if she was in a terrible situation, a terrible marriage, perhaps you could read it as, you know, the poor maiden, you know, married to the boorish, the boorish, terrible guy, sees a way out when, like, David the knight comes, you know, to save her. But, like, again, that, like, there was something inappropriate maybe about her using this as an opportunity, even though, I, again, like, you can see it, read it both ways, but just interesting that Midrash says, right, she had night and not Bo, because she ate should eat. She was still an ate eat, and she was, you know, perhaps more interested in David than she should have been, and therefore, Lefifa Pagamaha Katu, Abigail Tanina Abigail Ti, that we actually take out the, the Yud just to kind of, as almost like a token that Abigail perhaps is not so innocent here either, but again, like nothing nothing explicitly us or happens, right? And later on, they are formally they are formally married, which is interesting as well. Okay, um, the last kind of two things I want to show, which take us back to our charts, um, tries to get a little bit into David's head psychologically. So, chart number three, talks about something interesting, and it says, this is actually right, Moshe Garcia, who's a, a professor in Bar Ilan, and he, he write, wrote a, a lot of books on Sefer Shmuel, and he talks about how with, um, what's happening with, um, why does David overreact the way that he does? Why does David get so angry with what Naval says to him? And he explains that there are actually a lot of parallels between Naval and Shaul. Um, first of all, David uses similar language about both of them, right? But when he's yelling at Shaul, when he could have killed Shaul and he doesn't, he's like, you're Mishalem Ra'atah HaTova, like, I was so good to you, I was like this great soldier for you, I killed Gol Goliath, I did all these things, and you're paying me back evil. And with Nabal also, it's like, I watched all your sheep, and this is how you treat me, this is terrible. Um, also, what's interesting is the family members of both Shaul and Nabal are more loyal to who? To David, right? Whether it's Michal and Yonatan, whether it's Abigail here, than they are to their father. Um, and also, we see Naval acts like a king, right? When Abigail comes home, he's drunk because he's having a Mishnah uh, Melech, right? He's having a, almost sounds a little bit like Pashveros, right? He's having like, this big drunken party, treating himself like a king. So, Dr. Garcia, Professor Garcia, points out something fascinating that perhaps um, in David's eyes, when Naval starts talking, he's not seeing Naval, he's seeing who? Shaul. And it's almost that, like, it's almost like you have that where, let's say, like, you know, it doesn't happen in my note, but, like, you know, like, let's say you have a situation where, like, you're so angry at your boss, you know, but you can't say anything because you think you might get fired. So what do you do? You go home and you, like, take it out of your family, right? So, like, the same kind of, like, or someone else says something, like, slightly, and you, like, have a total overreaction. So the same thing here, that basically David can't, he yells a little bit at Shaul in the previous parrot, right? But, like, he can't fully get his anger out of Shaul because David's trying to, be politically smart, right? And he's trying to think about how one day I'm going to be king, and I want this to be legitimate. That like I had nothing bad against Shaul, I was innocent in this, but it for sure is bothering him. Like he's in exile, running around. You know, his, his wife's been taken. You know, it's, it's going to be taken away. Like this is definitely thing that's festering, that's bothering him. So when Naval says something like, "There's so many servants that are running away from their masters," and he sounds and acts exactly like Shaul, that's it. And David has like a tremendous overreaction. So one way to explain it, I think psychologically, why he overreacts is because he's seeing Naval. As Shaul, which is interesting, I think, for us to think about psychologically how we act, what triggers us, what triggers our reactions. Um, and finally, we'll conclude with this, is there are also, what's interesting, to spin it a little bit differently, a lot of parallels between David and Shaul. And how we saw, we saw how David went from acting like Yaakov to acting like Asa. Um, and what this is pointing out in the last chart over here, um, David starts taking on a lot of really terrible behaviors that Shaul is known for, and, and behaviors that really bother David about Shaul. For example, 
There's a whole story where Shaul wipes out the entire city of Nov, which is a, a, Kohen, a, a city full of Kohanim, because they aid David. It's a tremendous kind of massacre, uh, something that's really terrible. Um, and here we're seeing David almost does the same thing to Nabal, right? Someone betrays him, or so, not really betrays, but betrays their loyalty to him, and he is going to go and wipe out that entire city. Um, Shaul has been unjustly seeking revenge on David for like, you know, four or five parrots already, chasing him all over Eretz Israel and even outside of Eretz Israel, just uh, because it's a perceived threat against his authority. And here, David is attempting to seek revenge on Naval because of an insult against his authority. And I think something that's interesting here, as, as different Bible scholars point out, that um, David has almost become his worst nightmare, right? David his whole time has been railing against Shaul, railing, I'm not Shaul, I'm not Shaul, this isn't what I do, you know? And now what's happening? With story of he turns into Shaul. He turns into the person who, who gets insulted, wants to take it out, um, wants, to take, wants to get revenge, wants to wipe out an entire town. It's really, um, instead of here that I know is a, a much lighter thing, we might see in ourselves, right? You're saying different, like, I find that like, you're saying certain things, and you're like, I find sometimes my students, like I'll say something to my students when they want to hand in homework late or something like that, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I just became that teacher in high school. And you're like, I would never become, I just said that one line, you know? Or like, you find something, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm just like my mother, you know, or things like that, right? So like, it's a, on a lighter note, right? But here also, I think we see with, with, um, with David, like almost a wake up call, like, you know, you've really become Shaul in this case. And the importance, this a good way to end, of Abigail, you know, of really being the person who's able to talk him down. So what we did today was we had a chance to look at the story of David, Nabal, and Abigail. We saw how there are so many hints in this story to the story of David um, and Bathsheba. And we had a chance, and, and David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. And we saw how it didn't really happen in a vacuum. All those character traits of David are really there in the story. Just Abigail is able to talk him down in the story. And unfortunately, around with Bathsheba, there is no one there for him to seek advice from, because I think he's actively not looking to seek advice. And this results kind of really in the downfall of David. We also spoke about how psychologically, the different parallels to um, seeing Naval as Shaul, or even David himself becoming like Shaul, led to David's kind of overreaction. And I think for ourselves, an important message, I think a takeaway from this is, that when we think about character growth, character growth and we think about our traits, um, Rav Soloveitch has a beautiful idea in Al Hachuba when he talks about repentance. And he talks about how there's two different types of repentance. There's one when you think about the character traits you don't like, the parts about you that you don't like, and when you do chuba, you wipe them out. He talks about the Rabbah, you're supposed to change your name, you're supposed to move around, you're supposed to be able to say, Aini Oto Haish, I am not the person who did these sins. But that also really involves a complete uh, character change, right? You're basically like t getting rid of your entire personality from before, because you're like, I'm not that person, I'm totally different. But Rav Soloveitchik says that there's actually a higher level of tshuva, where you don't kind of eradicate your personality and take away things that were bad, but you take the things that were negative, and he calls it bi'ur hara v'haleto, that instead of destroying the negative, you raise it up, and you look for those character traits that are negative, but you use them for good. So if you did something that's wrong, use that experience to make sure that you're now gonna be even more sensitive to something that, you know, if you insulted someone, so instead of wiping out those traits, you're now gonna be even more sensitive to anyone who wants to say Lashon Hara that you would stop that, or kind of moving on in that direction. I think here we see this with David as well, um, that it's not about kind of eradicating the character traits that are positive. David is a good leader because he's, because he's charismatic, because he's powerful, because he wants to defend people. But the question really is how do we challenge it, which I think is our, our challenge uh, as well, like how do we challenge these traits and how do we work on ourselves to make sure that we're using who we are in the best possible way. Um, thank you so much. If you have questions, I'm happy to um, discuss more. Um, and next week, I think we're going to talk about Alicia. So that's going to be Christian Nakalami. So.